When you feed light into one end of a prism, you get a variety of colors on the other end. Likewise, one athlete can have a variety of public perceptions. They're multifaceted, one label doesn't stand alone. Sure, some of those labels shine brighter than others, blinding us to characterizations that, at one point in time, completely define the individual. When you put Aaron Rodgers into the prism, you see a future first ballot Hall of Famer, a Cinderella story, a long-haired COVID liar. But whatever you think of him now, Rodgers became the undeniable center of the Packers universe. Anything Green Bay related, from coaching decisions to free agency to draft picks, the reaction remained the same. What does this mean for Aaron Rodgers? But there was a time when the opposite was true. Let's not forget when the Packers belonged to Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers was the most hated man in Wisconsin. After slipping to the 24th pick of the 05 draft while everybody watched, Aaron Rodgers arrived in Green Bay, a city where nobody wanted him, save GM Ted Thompson, who drafted him. But maybe even he regretted the choice after getting criticized right and left. Drafting Rodgers was seen as a huge mistake. Nobody was saying Rodgers was a bad football player. They were saying he was a bad pick for the Packers. There was an immediate need for defense and offensive linemen. There was no immediate need for a QB because that job was taken by everybody's favorite. One pundit said drafting Rodgers was like spending thousands on a plasma screen TV when your roof is leaking. And that's the best case scenario, assuming Rodgers ends up being good in the NFL, something nobody could count on. Ted Thompson defended his choice. He took the best player available. He studied the tapes and believed Rodgers was a free plasma TV. You don't turn that down. Plus, the Packers weren't concerned about having two great quarterbacks. They had a plan to develop Rodgers under Favre until Favre was ready to step away. And surely that'll be a known set time that doesn't change. Not only would Rodgers learn from the Sage veteran, but he'd pick up reps when the aging Favre rested. The transition would be gradual and graceful and bother nobody. It was all planned out. A lot of first round QBs don't get drafted with a plan in mind. Unless it's, go into the fire, good luck, bye. But I kind of feel the plan was more PR than reality. Favre took 99% of snaps and practices and games, was extremely durable, and didn't like to sit out practice reps. So not sure what snaps Rodgers was gonna take. Oh, and also, Brett Favre didn't like or want to help Rodgers in any way. Before the season started, he famously said, my contract doesn't say I have to get Aaron Rodgers ready to play. Things looked bleak, so Rodgers just tried to control what he could. Didn't have many other options, though I suppose he could have completely given up. In practices, he ran the scout team against the Packers defense, and he really went for it. He played so hard it kind of pissed off his teammates, and he was eventually told to knock it off. Faced with the fact that Favre didn't want to help him, Rodgers quietly observed and studied the legend with serial killer-like thoroughness. But here's the thing. None of that changed the perception of Aaron Rodgers because nobody saw that stuff. It was all behind the scenes. In the scenes, fans either saw Rodgers holding the clipboard or playing poorly. Local media wasn't forgiving when he biffed it in the preseason, even though it was the preseason and he was with the second teamers. When Favre had some struggles that year, nobody wanted Rodgers to step in. The prevailing attitude was, if Favre couldn't do it, nobody could. Especially not Rodgers. With just a poor preseason to go on, analysts hypothesized Rodgers could be a flop on par with Joey Harrington, a third overall pick who went 26-50 and 50 as a starter for his career. The urge to contextualize, to label, had people ready to write Rodgers off when they'd barely seen him. Well, the urge to contextualize and the urge to condemn the QB who they didn't want. This was a local paper, after all. Rogers wasn't the first to have this happen to him, nor the last. There's a curiosity in everyone when it comes to the unknown, so we grasp at these comparisons and try to fill in. With hindsight, this is clearly a bad take, and we have hindsight, so let's enjoy our moment of superiority here. Who wrote this article? Idiot. In his sophomore season, Rodgers put in more behind-the-scenes work, attending new coach Mike McCarthy's intensive off-season quarterback school and cutting weight. Rodgers wasn't out of shape or anything, but the new coach had higher standards. 
and in November, he finally got his chance to play meaningful minutes when Favre got injured against New England. Time for Rodgers to show Green Bay what he's made up. Ah, crap. The game was a big ol' loss. Before Favre got injured, he didn't fare much better than Rodgers, but Rodgers was still maligned, even by his own offensive coordinator. Everybody's riding the I hate Rodgers train. But what really damned him in the court of public opinion wasn't his stats, but rather the way he treated his teammates. On the field, he blamed them with his body language, acting irritated and even disgusted with his O-line. Leaders don't do that. Favre doesn't do that. To be fair, Rodgers might have been cranky because he apparently broke his foot in the third quarter, but that info came out a few days after the game and judgments had already been made. Before the 07 season, Favre retirement rumors swirled and the city of Green Bay shook in their shoes not wanting to be left with non-leader Rodgers. To their delight, Favre stayed on, and Aaron Rodgers spent another year on the sideline. He had some increased responsibility behind the scenes and proved to be a savvy scout. And hey, it helped him on the field. Late November, in a game against the Cowboys, Favre hurt his elbow and Rodgers got quality minutes. And I mean quality. He attributed that success to his intensive scouting. Unfortunately, he didn't see any more action that year. It was Favre's team, after all. But then, finally, in 2008, Favre retired. After three years of waiting, Rodgers would get a chance to be an NFL starting quarterback and show everyone what he'd been working on all those years. Thing is, nobody wanted to see it. Who cares about his one good game? He's no Favre, they said. He's too fragile, they said. And that would be the nicest stuff they said about Rodgers for a while. Because, four months after retiring, Favre said he wanted to come back, actually. And... Considering he was really great the previous season, everyone expected him to come back to his old spot and maybe also get a parade where he rode in on an elephant like a king. But instead, the Packers offered him the backup role, didn't let him even compete with Rodgers for the starting spot, and then ended up trading him. This did not go over well. Nobody understood what the hell the Packers were thinking. And Favre took the treatment personally. He made a public stink. Fans couldn't handle it. They held a protest slash vigil at Lambeau Field in support of Favre. And though they were upset with Packers management, they took their anger out on Aaron Rodgers, the guy who thinks he can replace Favre, Judas. At training camp, the fans let loose, cursing Rodgers for existing. Even little kids were yelling the F word at him. Can you imagine? hating Aaron Rodgers, hating anyone so much that you tell your kid, cursing is wrong except in this instance. Go get that fucker. Fans would wait outside the player parking lot to scream at him. No peace for the man who isn't Brett Favre. So, what could the man who isn't Brett Favre do? Not much other than play football. Although, I suppose he did have that completely give up option. His years of behind the scenes efforts began to show right away. He played with maturity, with skill, with guts. And that allowed, or forced, those watching to start appreciating the first-year starter. Yeah, there remained some criticism, a 6-10 and 10 record needed to be improved upon, and how come he couldn't get come-from-behind wins? Is he going to be a strong enough leader? Fair questions. In 2021, one of Rogers' offensive linemen helped put all that behind-the-scenes work into perspective. Lucas Patrick explained why Rodgers barking at him doesn't bother him. Relationships on a football team are like an emotional bank account. A lot of guys in this locker room, there's been a lot of deposits. And unfortunately, you guys don't get to see the deposits. And sometimes they're daily, sometimes they're weekly, sometimes it's one big one every two or three months. Um, but most of the time, y'all see the withdrawals. Patrick's metaphor can be applied to the quarterback's early relationship with fans. When people didn't see Rodgers' deposits of working hard behind the scenes, every withdrawal, a bad preseason game, being someone other than Farm, failing to get fourth quarter wins, was a huge deal. But in 2009, his ever-improving performance was a series of deposits everyone could see. Rodgers led the Packers to an 11-5 record, took them into the playoffs, got them to overtime, and then fumbled the game away. In other words, he made a big old withdrawal in front of everybody. And Green Bay still liked him? Seems there'd been enough deposits to cover the season-ending fumble. 
Fans and the press had done a full 180 degree rotation in their perception of Aaron Rodgers. And that perception was further cemented when the very next season, Rodgers led him to a Super Bowl victory. And the good times kept rolling. In 2011, he was league MVP in a statistical marvel. In 2012, Wisconsin created Aaron Rodgers Day. He was MVP again in 2014. With each new accolade, it became harder and harder to remember that there was once a time when nobody wanted him. The good times have a way of shouting over the bad times. Even the Packers had forgotten the dark days. In 2020, the Packers traded up to draft QB Jordan Love, a potential Rodgers successor. And why not? It seemed like Rodgers was aging out of stardom. And the last time they drafted a successor to an aging hero, they got Aaron Rodgers. And uh, that worked out pretty well, didn't it? What's that about their own fans turning on them in a damaged relationship with the face of their franchise? Sorry, can't hear you over the memory of Aaron Rodgers winning the Super Bowl. There is at least one guy who remembered the Everybody Hates Rodgers era. While he was pissed the Packers drafted Jordan Love without even telling him, he went out of his way to tell the press it's not Love's fault, he doesn't hold anything against Love. In short, hey fans, don't scream profanity at the guy while he's trying to park his car. In the aftermath of the Love draft, Rodgers was wishy-washy about whether or not he'd return to the Packers, giving subtle leading messages in the media. I don't think that there's any reason why I wouldn't be back, but look, I think th there's, there's not many absolutes, as you guys know, in this business. It echoed Brett Favre's will he, won't he retire saga, but there was a difference. Rodgers, remembering just how much fun it was to have another QB's decision controlling his fate, made an effort to be good to love during those non-committal times. Meanwhile, he had an on-field resurgence and won back-to-back -back MVP titles in 2020 and 2021 further supplanting the memory of Aaron Rodgers the Unwanted with Aaron Rodgers the Star. It probably helps that nobody's trying to remember. Who wants to admit to having a terrible take? Once Rodgers became a starter, he used the maturity and experience he collected on the bench behind Favre to excel, and thus shift perception. Throughout his career, there were more shifts. There are many lights to view Aaron Rodgers through, and surely new ones will emerge. But for now, none shine brighter than Aaron Rodgers, the center of the Packers universe. That one's so bright, it blinds you to the time when he was merely clinging to the edge of that very same universe. Thanks for watching episode two of Prism. You can find the first episode right here, or you can spend some more time with Aaron Rodgers. Hit subscribe if you're so inclined, and I'll miss you till next time. For Secret Base, I'm Clara Morris. Good night and good game.